Stellar Blade has hit the scene and created a buzz in the gaming world for good and bad reasons. Since release, Stellar Blade has been hit with some mixed reviews, extremely high user scores, and controversy. With all this discord, Marsman has sent me on my next mission to review Stellar Blade for the PS5 and answer some important questions. Is Stellar Blade actually fun? Does Eve truly have great assets? Was the game censored or not censored enough? This is Frank from Marsman Gaming, and in this review, I will give you the good, the bad, and address these questions in my final verdict. Let's dive into it. But before we continue with the review, if you like variety gaming content such as reviews, opinion pieces, and streams, make sure to hit that thumbs up and subscribe to support the channel. Also hit that bell button to get notifications for future content. And now, back to the review. Stellar Blade was developed by Shift Up, a South Korean developer whose previous work was in the mobile gaming market, with its claim to fame being a visual novel game, Destiny Child, released in 2018 in the US. And in 2019, they announced Project Eve, which would become Stellar Blade, a large-scale console game with a huge leap in stakes and a completely new world the studio has entered in. Now with the marketing, the demo, and even up into its release, there have been quite a few voices out there painting Stellar Blade as a Souls-like game, mostly due to the combat. Now I love me some Souls-like games, but the more you play Stellar Blade, the more you see that this is truly an action-adventure game with some Souls-like and some RPG elements mixed in. It has some slices of Sekiro, some seasoning of Lies of P, and some splashes of Devil May Cry and Bayonet. I think you get the message. And this concoction of elements have given you its final form. But did it work? Yes! For the most part. Some elements they nailed, while others they did not. First, let's start with what they did well. And without question, they nailed the action of this action-adventure game. The gameplay and combat is fun, dynamic, Difficult, but not too unforgiving to push away newcomers. This game's combat will heavily remind you of Sekiro and most recently, Lies of P, where you face large bosses, a variety of enemies, either one-on-one -on -one or at times in a group, and they have different attacks and cadences of their attacks. Timely parrying with strategic attacks and combos are imperative for your success. The more perfect parries you do, the more you can stagger your enemy and deal a fatal attack. This is also not a one-button mash fist. You have a quick and heavy attack and certain button combos will prop different moves. You also unlock four beta moves, four burst moves, which prompt an animated attack that is more powerful than normal combos, and reminds me of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth abilities. You also unlock Attacky Mode, which is the equivalent of going Super Saiyan for a period of time. I also can't forget that you unlock a gun, with four different ammo types to give you some long range attacks and options to change the style you want to play. But one of the most important aspects for this kind of combat system is how precise the hit and parry boxes or registration is. And well, it's pretty damn solid. It may not be as precise or as fast paced as Sekiro, but the difficulty in Stellar Blade is less severe and it's also less clunky than Lies of P. It's not perfect and can use some further tuning, but for the majority of my playthrough, it felt pretty satisfying once you get used to it. Now, what is the big difference from Stellar Blade you may be asking from other Souls-like games? And that is Stellar Blade is way more forgiving overall. This goes beyond parrying and dodging. When you die, which can happen quite a bit with some of these tough bosses and being attacked by multiple enemies, you are not losing, say, your runes, your souls, and in this game, your very important experience that you use to level up your skills, which would result in you having to truck your ass over to the same spot you died or from the previous checkpoint to retrieve them without dying again again and losing it all. There are frequent checkpoints in this game, and some cases versus bosses you will reappear right before the boss instead of going back to the last checkpoint. In this game you also don't have builds or stat points similar to other Souls-like games. You level up a skill tree with your experience. Enemies will also give you more indicators on what attack they are about to perform. For games like Sekiro and Lies of P, you see this mechanic when an enemy is about to give a fatal attack or one that can't be blocked. For Stellar Blade, you get an indicator for a chain attack, a fatal attack, and even attacks where they are attempting to grapple you with its own color prompt. They also help assist you when to perform a perfect parry or dodge with an indicator on your sword. For a purist, this may feel this makes the game easy, but I think this opens the combat up for more casual players. There are some things I wish were tweaked, like the enemy locking system can be a sensitive pain, and I hate that when you use your gun it unlocks your view on the enemy. I also think although the final blow animations are really cool, I wish there wasn't a QT 
PTE involvement, but overall the gameplay is pretty awesome. The next aspect I want to dive into is the environment and designs. Let's start with the character designs and they are great. Yes, Eve and the rest of the Airborne squad is a collection of hot women warriors with hourglass builds, and Eve looks like she can squat a refrigerator, but the other characters stand out as well. There is a variety in the designs, they are distinct, you can see the difference between the squad members from the colony who look clean and those that dwell on the earth that look more run down. The Natiba look gross and mutated. Most of the characters are pretty well designed. Well, maybe outside of Kaya, who looks like she can palm two NBA basketballs. I mean, damn. Look at those things. Now let's talk about the world. Throughout the game, you will travel to nine regions or levels, with one region being your main hub. These regions vary from a rundown city to wastelands, deserts, labs, sewers, and so on. And the design and set pieces for these regions are downright stunning at times. They really capture the dire straits of the current world and give you enough variability that everything doesn't look or feel the same. The world design is also complemented very well by the music of the game. The tracks vary using instruments, chords, at times some metal elements, and even K-pop. When roaming different sections, the music is calm and picks up when confronting bosses. It's a unique OST and its own kind of vibe, but it works. Many have said that the soundtrack of Stellar Blade reminds them of the air, and it just so happens that one of the studios, Monica, that worked on the soundtrack of the game, that is run by Kiyoshi Okobe, who also worked on the air. I would love to drop some tracks on this video, but with potentially the Sony Warlords ready to strike, I unfortunately cannot and suggest listening to it yourself. With the character design, look of the levels and music, Shift Up created an environment that you are interested to explore. One last thing before we head to what the game failed at, and also a good time to give a reminder to make sure if you haven't done so yet, hit that thumbs up and subscribe for future content. Also, think about joining our Discord for what you can find in the description. And now back to dishing out some more praise. And boy, let's talk about the performance of the game. Stellar Blade offers three modes resolution, balance, and performance, and all worked pretty well. My favorite mode was balance mode as it had a good mix of FPS and visual quality and rarely had any issues in performance outside of some rare rendering issues and cutscenes. I wanted to make note of this because in a gaming world where big developers fail to give console gamers options or modes that are not well optimized at launch, I will give Shift Up credit for giving gamers both. With the good, we have to talk about the bad. And after all the credit I gave the game for nailing the action in this action adventure game, I think the adventure component in this game is lacking, and that's mainly due to the story and missions. Now I'm going to avoid spoilers as much as I can, so I will only tell you the basic concept of the story. As mentioned prior, you play as Eve, a soldier who is part of the colony who was sent by Mother Sphere to liberate humans on Earth versus the Natiba, which are these mutated creatures. As the story goes on, you unlock more and more secrets about all the parties involved, and question yourself on what the actual right thing to do is. Now I will stop there with the details, but the concept as I say it sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? The problem is the execution and delivery of said story just comes off as painfully mid or okay. There are supposed to be these big plot turning or emotional moments that just don't hit because the buildup just isn't executed, especially in the first half of the game. There are 14 main missions that range from open world missions to more linear designs that take around 19 to 20 hours to complete, and 53 side missions broken up to missions you get from NPCs and those from the request bulletin board. These can make your playthrough balloon up to over 32 hours to complete. Now these side missions are important to do to unlock items and skill points to level up, but once again feel pretty painfully redundant to complete, especially in the first half of the game. Let me give you examples. Many side missions require you to go to the NPC or request board, hear some or read some dialogue that asks you to find someone or retrieve something. Hey, can you find my friend who went here and haven't heard back from? You go and he's dead. You pick up his memory stick, read his last words. Hey, I think my woman is cheating on me. Can you go talk to her? Then you go look for her and she's dead. You pick up her memory stick with her last words. Hey, can you find my cat? You track the location and the cat's dead. You pick up the memory stick. Hey, can you go find my grandma? She went to go grab the groceries and guess what? She's dead. I think you get the message. Now they are not all bad. There are some that are multi-phase that give you a decent side story or lead you to a secret boss, but they are too few of them. Now I will give credit that when you complete a mission, they ask you if you want to be 
automatically fast travel to the client or request board to receive your reward or continue with your journey, which I appreciate. Ahem, you hear that Dragon's Dogma too? Now many have blamed this story issue due to the main character Eve, saying she is a flat or boring character, for which I disagree. Eve is quiet and naive to a lot of things on the planet, but she does show emotional range and growth. She does express things that annoy her throughout the game and is more dynamic than people give her credit for. Plus, we have seen examples of soft-spoken protagonists that don't need to be overly emotional to be badass and impactful, and Eve can fit in that circle. She is not just some hot, empty shell. What I think is lacking more is the lack of more dynamic characters around Eve, more so than Eve herself. The plot can also be confusing, and it gives you three endings that result in a decent ending, a bad ending, and an awful ending. Hint, give yourself a chance and boost that relationship with Lily. There also isn't much choice or decision decision making throughout the game until the end, which makes this adventure of this game look as wide as an ocean, but as shallow as a puddle. The last aspect I want to address is the customization in the game. Now make no mistake, it is not awful by any stretch, but more hit and miss in my opinion. First off, the game deserves credit for offering a boatload to unlock without microtransactions, and there is a heavy emphasis on unlocking outfits for your main protagonist Eve. When you include the deluxe version of the game, there are 40 nano suits or outfits to unlock, and another 34 additional suits in New Game Plus. This includes 12 glasses, 10 earrings, and the ability to adjust Eve's hairstyle and color. I mean, you can change Eve to look however hot and badass you want with a wider range of options, which is cool. But do you know how many weapons you can unlock? One! Yes, one! The Stellar Blade from the beginning of the game, and a gun early on with four different slug types. I like the different beta and burst abilities like I said before, but man, would I have loved to have add-ons to your weapons or new blades that give some variability to your quick and heavy attacks, or basic combos. It feels like a huge missed opportunity, and does put a low ceiling on the different strategies you can use in your really fun combat. Finally, the last part of my tale is probably the ugliness surrounding Stellar Blade, and this is in reference to the uncensored or censored controversy of the game. At first, I didn't want to jump into this sweaty and dirty rabbit hole, as it really didn't affect my opinion on the game itself, but since it has become such a big topic, I feel it should be addressed since it appears we have two loud minorities yelling into the gaming space while the majority of us just wanted a good game. The first group I want to discuss is some of the gaming journalists. When the game trailers and demo came out for this game, a lot of conversations about the potential over-sexualization of the main character, and unfortunately it appears that has bled into some of the reviews of this game with statements like this, and unfortunately they are not alone. We have seen quite a bit of statements in multiple reviews and it appears it has diminished the overall score of the game. Now I'm not here to tell fellow reviewers how to score a game, but how is it possible to say Eve is hurt by over-sexualization and critically acclaimed Baldur's Gate 3 is not? Baldur's Gate 3 has far more nudity and you can practically bang everyone under the sun in that game. Some may say, well Baldur's Gate 3's sexualization pushes the game plot as Eve's looks does not. Maybe so, but I'm not sure how having your genitalia out for an entire game, which you can do in Baldur's Gate 3, enhances the gameplay. I don't say this to suggest Baldur's Gate 3 should be punished, as it shouldn't, but it feels massively hypocritical to punish Stellar Blade as some sort of purity test. Yes, the game made Eve attractive, and there are quite a lot of outfits that show some serious skin, but there are outfits that don't, and it leaves it up to the player to decide how horny they want to be. Also, yes, Eve has the hourglass build, but so does practically everyone part of the airborne squad. And yes, there is a large amount of ladders, ropes, and camera angles in this game but it's up to you to zoom in on Eve's dump truck. All jokes aside, the point being is Eve is not close to the first protagonist to be attractive for no reason, nor will she be the last, but she appears to be one of the few that will be punished for it. The other side of the fence, is the free Stellar Blade protest and boycott around the censorship of the game. For those that aren't aware of this controversy, and bless you if you aren't, the game had a day one patch where they made slight changes to two wardrobes in the game. Some will bring up changes in gore, but that has not been verified and it appears to be somebody playing on two different game modes one that has less resolution. As you see in the outfits playing in the background of this video, you really have to dig deep into the pixels to catch it right away, but I'll show you which ones they are. These one inch of pixelated cloth edits caused a crap storm around the game to petitions, with participants submitting some of the most cringiest responses you can find, for which I will save you the heartburn by not showing it, and accusations of false advertisement on the developers. Now first things first, these two outfits I don't even remember as part of the initial advertisement. You can literally 
currently wear a skin suit showing practically everything Eve has to offer, and there are at least a dozen of Nano suits that are just as or more provocative than those two censored outfits. If they truly wanted to make a watered down or heavily censored game, they would be changing quite a bit of these. A lot of folks would also bring up The Last of Us Part 2 and Baldur's Gate 3 as to why were they not censored but Stellar Blade was, and a simple search would show you that they were in fact censored versions for Japan that removed way more than Stellar Blade did. Baldur's Gate also made changes from its early access to its final product, but there was no major outcries or boycotts. Unfortunately, these things happen in all forms of media, and from all your favorite developers due to commercial and regional pressures. I don't know the reasons behind changing these outfits. The developer said it was their final creative decision, and censorship overall is not good, but unfortunately, it will never leave. And you should absolutely fight censorship that greatly affects the integrity and core components of a game. Problem is, these other events didn't cause major outcry, or people were okay with the censorship for one particular example, but not for others. Stellar Blade Changes is way less egregious than some of these other examples, and the movement feels way overblown, and unfortunately, some of you need to go touch some grass. Listen, I am here to share my opinion, and will not disregard you if you disagree with me. I also won't tell you how to spend your money or waste your time. I'm just a simple gamer whose main focus is on gameplay, stories, and if the game is actually fun. The other stuff to me is just noise. Overall, Stellar Blade had positives and negatives. The gameplay and action in this game is fun, dynamic, and very satisfying. The world can be absolutely stunning to look at with some great music to vibe to. The characters have great assets and designs, but the story and missions inside this adventure can be pretty boring and shallow. The censorship debate has overshadowed the good and bad aspects of this game, but with all the BS aside, I have to say, I was impressed. I am giving Stellar Blade an 8 out of a 10 on our Galactic Grade. Thank you everyone for watching. What are your thoughts on Stellar Blade? What do you feel is the best and worst parts of it? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, make sure to check out some of our other review videos that we have done recently on Final Fantasy VII and Dragon's Dogma 2. This is Frank from Marsman Gaming, signing off. Game on. <laughs>